If you've never lived in Texas, you may never understand what it is to have a Lone Star carved, faceted, whatever, which way you want it. But for me, it's an important piece of history in my life because I lived in Texas for so long. So I'm going to show you how to make a raised and faceted star, which is, we did um, another one on a uh, two-dimensional star where we did contrasting woods, very nice, and part of that uh, we could use on this because this star you would usually inlay as a, a decorative feature in a piece of furniture or in a, a coaster, whatever you want to do. So what I've done is I've come up with a system for making this and this is how I'm going to show you how to make it. If you can ignore this uh, curve here, I'm not using that. I didn't find it was any real advantage. I found it was a long cut that was difficult. But these two cuts here, this is a poor man's mitre box, but it's not 45 degrees. These are 54 degrees, two opposite 54 degrees. I just glued a piece of wood onto here with super glue, and then I cut these very accurately with a very thin saw. So when my saw goes into the kerf, uh, it, it's uh, almost sandwiched between the two sides. It's so fine. Uh, I don't go down very far because I don't need to go down very far. That's how I'm going to um, establish the mitres. And we know why it's called a mitre because when you're finished, it's always, you always think to yourself, oh, that might have been better, right? So here's the star and I've got these facets. It's these internal corners that are the most important, these angles. They've got to be dead on 54 because of the combination of numbers and the amounts of pieces. So. This is what we're going to do. I've got my pieces. I've picked mine to be half an inch wide. They're three quarters deep and they're 12 and a half inches long. And what we'll do first of all, we're going to make a mark on these two pieces of wood just as a reference. I'm coming in from the end half an inch. There's my half inch. I move up a one and a half and I move up in increments of one and a half. These are just the start points for my cuts on the mitre block. Box, what? box, mitre box. Okay. Now I've, I've, I'm making some extras because what I've noticed every time I cut them, I find that uh, there'll be a surface defect in the wood or something. I've used this dark wood. I don't even know what it is. I think it could be something like Zocote or something like that. So we've got those start points. Now these, we bring the mitre box in, and these start points, so I've got this laid out in my mind. I'm using this, this is called a zona saw, but it's actually just a very fine-toothed modeler's saw. Put that first mark on the, on, the, on the mitre, and follow me. Now, I'm gonna cut down about a quarter of an inch. because the facets are not very big. Slide it up to the next line and do the same. Now, this is sticking because of this particular type of wood and it slips and slides. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a clamp because it makes me look bad when it slides. Just add a little pressure there. And let that saw flow, just let it flow into the wood. Don't try uh, rigidly keeping it on track. Just let it flow and it'll go into the saw kerf nicely for you, hopefully. If it doesn't, use a little bit of oil on the side of your plate, the rag in a can oiler. Now these are pretty critical, these mitres, because you don't really want to have to adjust them once they go in. You may end up adjusting one at some point. That last one sometimes can be a little off or if you have a combination of several quarter of a de degree inaccuracies, you might need to fix something at the end of this. So I keep sliding along. I only need five really, but as I said, it's definitely worth making some extras. 
because setting up to do it again just takes time. Now I've made it with my other gent saw where the teeth have been 17 teeth to the inch and it's worked fine. I didn't find it as crisp on that internal mitre on the points where they all come together so that's why I'm suggesting you might want to invest in a zoner anyway because they're a remarkable little saw. I'm going to do the same on the opposite, uh, on the, its opposite part, but I'm going to do exactly the opposite this time. I'm going to go from this side, and I think this is very important to remember, it's an opposite cut. This is cherry, this one, it's very nice, the cherry just cuts so easily not hard at all. I'll see how I feel about these cuts need to be perpendicular which is why when you're making your mitre box make sure you feel that it's accurate. Because uh, any minor discrepancy will become a major discrepancy in the end. Very nice. So inch and a half between these points. Even with the mitre box, make sure, see I'm going deep on this side so that it's guiding my saw for perpendicularity. And if it's slightly off, it, it doesn't make much difference, I've noticed. In this case. Now one of the difficulties I think with this, whoops, is that you often can't see what the difference is which part you want to keep and which part you want to throw away but don't worry about that for now so now the next step is going to be we're going to do these long cuts so we abandon the mitre box now and we've got our protractor set now in this case I can't use this one because it's set for the opposite side because we reset this. This is set for 18 degrees. Or, yeah, 18 degrees. So when I put this on, I want this. I've got two examples here in front of me because of my age. Okay. We've got this set and we slide the knife right up against it. This is going to create a knife wall. I'm going right up on, I'm really careful to get right on the edge of, on this cut, this cross grain cut that I did, I'm going right up onto the corner because this will guarantee exactness in the finished size. Because I want them all to be exactly the same length, the point to point length, and I want them to be exactly the same width. So this is an emphasis on, on the need for accuracy. Look what the knife wall gives you though here. Beautiful, beautiful crisp lines. Am I going to run out at the other end? A place for my stock to go against? I think I can come from the opposite face anyway. See here? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to make some cuts into that. Just to give it a little step down for the saw to sit in. Oh, 
bit of a recess. I want accuracy, accuracy all the way through this. We cannot make a mistake on the Lone Star Star. So you're going to go down the same depth as you just did. I'm going with a regular gent saw this time because it's got bigger teeth, it's a rip cut. So check yourself for perpendicular as you go down. And you're going down about a quarter of an inch. what happens now I'm going to take my marking gauge I've got one set for I've forgotten the measurement it's whatever the distance is I think it's uh, not a dead-on measurement it's 3 sixteenths plus a 30 second and then I've got this one set for 1 8 plus a 30 second this goes down as well. One is the final cut, and this first one is my bevel cut. So I'm using this as a reference for me to plane to. I'm going to plane across the tops of these facets. So put it in the vise. You can angle it just a little bit, probably, and then take a plane, and number four will work fine. You can set it quite deep for a start. I think you'll love making this. Working accurately, this is important. Get down to that line on the one face first. Once I, oh, see, I'm right on the line now. So I'm taking out the midsection because this corner is my other registration point. Backing off my iron a little bit. I want a clear shaving from the gauge line to that top corner because that's what's going to guarantee these facets are the same height all the way through. So I'm right on that gauge line, I still have another gauge line. I'm going to do the same on this other one now. So I now have to replicate. I want to make sure I get an opposite, so I brought that into play. I've got to reverse this all the way around to 18 degrees on the opposite side. How important is this 18 degrees? I think it is important. Uh, so I go to that cross grain point again I go right on to the curve on the very corner of the curve and make a pull with my knife this wood is so different than that uh, cherry I'm part wishing I didn't use it but it's got a mind of its own Sometimes you come across woods and then you wonder why it was in Iraq for five years or ten years and then you remember why. Okay. 
Now, if these are slightly out of a slight discrepancy in size, all is not lost at all. Because you can, we're going to do, so I'll show you in a minute how we're going to do some trimming on some of this. Mm, that last one is no good, so I don't need to cut that one. Okay, which is my best way to cut this? <laughs> There's no other way. I just go in. Am I going to do the knife wall? I am. Turn it around so I can push into the knife wall. That will tell you which side of the knife wall I'm working on. So this is the waist side of the knife wall. So brittle, this man. This is really almost the bulk of the work in terms of cutting. We, there's really not much left to this. I've seen so many pieces of furniture when I lived in Texas with the star right bang in the middle. Carved, chip carved, inlaid, raised. Every institution has a star in it somewhere. I could sell more furniture with stars in than I ever could without when I lived in Texas. I don't need this last one, why am I doing it? Okay, so drop your saw on the waist side of your knife wall and run it down to that quarter inch, somewhere like quarter of an inch. I like this because the, the saw just slipped right into the kerf, right up to the knife wall, very nicely. This wood has a lot of oil in it. Oops. Come back. That's easy by machine, I don't think. I think this is probably the first time I ever saw this done was with a young apprentice who I had known for a few years, and he was cutting a faceted star on a chop saw with a stick pushing the wood against the fence. And uh, I just felt a panic in my stomach and I went away and cut my first faceted star. And uh, used that system ever since and they did too, the apprentices did. Isn't it funny when you have a burden for something you invent something. There you go, that's that one. Okay. Okay, we're gonna run the gauge lines again. This one's my depth, my overall cut line. When I separate the facets off, and this is my bevel line. Heavy set, just because it's not got any wood to it. I'm looking at surface grain on this because I could be planing against the grain and not know it.
I'm looking for that top corner line now. Yep, I'm down to the gauge line. Okay. Got it. Nice crisp lines. It's a nice plain surface. I don't seem to have any tear out from awkward grain. And there are my exact opposites. So now I go to the bandsaw and I'm going to rip down to that second gauge line. I'm going to leave the gauge line in just a little bit. So set my bandsaw. Let's see what I got. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move it over a little bit. I put this piece of plywood in just to catch the blade, uh, the pieces as they come from the blade. So I'm setting my distance. I've left a little bit on for me to uh, plane. I'm going to switch everything on. That went nicely. Now I've got to be careful which ones I throw away and which pieces I keep. Let's take a look. What we're looking for, we're looking for the long edge to be parallel. This one's not parallel, this one's parallel on the long on the wrong edge. So I know which ones to throw away. Just pick those out and get rid of them. Then there won't be any confusion. Hopefully. Okay, so those are my throwaway pieces. Get rid of those and these. One, two, go, go. One, two. So I'm, what I'm looking for, I think what I've got here, I've got a thick edge, that's not the one, and this one tapers, it's out of parallel. What I'm looking for is the parallel, and if I take this now and put it with another facet like this, then you'll start to see that I've got the peak in the middle and the outside rim on both sides is 1 16th up from the underside of the pieces. So that's what I was explaining. And that's, so I'm picking out the ones I don't want really because otherwise I'll get confused. And so will you. Great, that's me, that's it. So how many pieces do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's great. Okay, so what's next? This is the next bit. This is the exciting bit because now we've got to do some jointing along the joint lines. Let me get some of this black powdery stuff away. So we've done the cuts. And it's amazing really because, because we took that time. The top of this ridge is perfect. If it's not, don't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it for sure. What we're going to do now is take this Number four, and we're going to put it in the vise. Now, I will say this, if you've got a 
uh, a small plane like this, you could do this. In fact, I'll do the same. You can do exactly the same with this one. A number four will work fine. Let me see how I feel about this. I'm just taking a scrap to see how it feels. Yep, feels sharp. Ooh, mind your fingers. Okay. So what we're gonna do is just level this up. I've gone inside the vise jaws so I don't break off these parts. I don't want to break that part on my plane. If you go inside the jaw, down a little bit, not too much pressure. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each of these facets now and pair them up. So there's a pair. Is that a pair? There's a pair. So I've got the ridges uppermost. There's a pair. How many do I want to do? I don't have to glue all of them. I just need five, right? Okay, so that's how they've come together. Now then, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these and we're gonna edge joint these edges just in case they're out of square. So I've brought the square edges together. So if I show you what I did, the bottom side is flat and the perpendicular wall here, this is, is 90 degrees to it, or it should be. If it's slightly off, it won't glue up nicely. So we bring these two faces and bring them together like this, and then we press them on the bench. Now then, you'll notice that I've got, I'm looking at the grain because if I go this way, I'll be going against the grain. So I'm turning it round, I'm placing it on the surface of the plane, I'm feeling for the edge, and now I'm just pressing down. I'm squeezing these two faces together and pulling until I get a clear cut. Once I get a clear cut, I should get a perfect joint line, and I did. Once I've got that joint line, I can place this here, do the same on the next one, bring the two faces up together like this. Check my grain direction, because I don't want to plane into the grain, I want to plane with the grain, not against it. So I'm pushing these two facets together, squeezing the faces together and pulling once, pulling twice. That should be enough to clear. If it's not, I can go back in and do it. I'm gonna put these together to see if my joint line is good, and it is. So this now is this one. So I've got to do this five times. You don't need to do a spare because you can always glue that one up later. So I'm squeezing and pressing, and now I'm on the surface of my plane. If I feel resistance, I just work with the angle that I'm presenting it to this, the uh, sole of the plane there. Good joint line, I think I have a good joint line. Now I've noticed there's a couple of discrepancies in the length of my points, which could be for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is my inaccuracy, maybe. Yep, it happens. There, very nice. But it could be to do with the type of wood. If you can blame the wood, always blame the wood, right? Okay. I'm pressing down. Careful, now be very careful. If you feel uncomfortable with this, you could put some masking tape on either side that will shield you a little bit. I don't feel uncomfortable at all, but you might, and you have to go off what your own gut feeling is. There are my joint lines all done. So what's next? Now then, what I'm gonna do is glue these up. I'm going to use, uh, I've used white wood glue, the uh, PVA, and I've used Super glue, and I'm going with super glue because I found that the super glue didn't mark the wood, it was easy to clean off. I liked it, I liked the way it came out, and it was instant because I'm using an accelerator here. So I've just pulled some strips of paper across here so I have access to it. And now I'm ready to glue these together. What we do is we, we put the points, these two points at the interior are the most important, those short points. Press it on one side, stretch your tape to the other side. You can put two pieces on if you want to. When you lift this up, it'll open up just a little bit. Open it up more and then put a, 
a bead of super glue right down the length like that and then press it together watch I'm pressing it together on my wood on my piece of wood I'm going to spray with this accelerator just a little bit until it's glued now that's glued I don't have to worry about that I can set it aside now and leave it for a few minutes do the same to the next one make sure the points the short points are dead on stretch your tape flip over and it'll pull apart and that should keep those outside facets in line with one another now this super glue will wick in any gap so I don't really worry about uh, the gaps Oops. and just accelerate it turn it over you can press it together further if you want to now super glue is not really a very strong adhesive but we're going to be inlaying these stars probably most likely and even if we're not it'll be strong enough to hold these together just fine onto one piece press with your thumb pull it tight and that will pull the two edges together flip over and add your glue be careful with the super glue of course won't you should have said that from the beginning just be careful when you're spraying the accelerator because the heat from it can be very high so be careful two more get those points lined up so very important because if they're not it'll show on that midpoint and uh, people will examine this star for perfection like nothing else like a dovetail really squeeze just takes a few seconds maybe two or three seconds for the glue to do its job or the accelerator to do its job oh this I love making these stars I love them I love them okay and that's how we glue up the five points of a star now you can make as many points to a star as you want uh, it just depends and then you have to change of course change the angles of just about everything when you do but it's still worth doing so that's that so I can take this off and I'll work through each one I'm going to leave the others just a little bit longer to set up now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take I want these points to come to a very crisp face so I'm going to go on here and pull what we're going to do first though I'm going to take a straight edge now I'm going to change to my number four because I have the extra width that that didn't give me I just put that in because you might have a block plane and you might want to use it because you don't use it for anything hardly at all okay there you go I've, this is 90 degrees this to this face is 90 degrees so I pull this on here and I take the edge of my star the long side of my star and I just pull it along here that's guaranteeing that this edge now is square and I'm looking at the point where the two points come together because I want them to be perfect I move over to this side and do the opposite the dark wood side and I pull so now I've got crisp clean edges these faces came off that zona saw they're very fine I'm very happy with them if I want to clean up this face and this face now I put this onto the surface of my plane and I pull it across the surface just like this and that one cleaned up nicely I'm doing the opposite side so I've got nice crisp faces now now the thickness here might vary a little bit so that's why I cut this notch in here which is commensurate to the wedge itself and I've angled the underside so when I put this on the surface of the plane I can start right at the point of the star and I can press down on the sole of the plane so it leaves a slight gap and push it 
And now I've surface planed the underside of my point of my star. So great, that was wonderful. This one seems to need a bit more. Oh no, it doesn't, I thought it did, a little bit. So I can put this, watch this, I put it against my block of wood and I move both the block of wood and the star point with, this, with it. And flip over, go to the opposite side because I've got the facet on that side. I've got that done. Now I go in with my face of my star. If I have to change direction, I will. If I need to go this way, I can. I just want to be conscious of the grain. See, I feel like I was pulling against the grain there. So I backed off and now I'm pulling from this face. And that did fine. So you've got to be careful. See, that feels like I'm going against the grain. So I'm turning around and going from the opposite face. And I have to take a little extra off, which I didn't want to. But I've got a perfect, perfect point. Got some tape in there. Oops, wrong way up. Great, great, great. So now I'm looking at that internal corner, the two facets coming together. This one is slightly wider, so I can go in here, take a couple of shavings, bring it back and put it in place. like uh, juggling with swords a little bit. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Did, I've just got super glow on this one, that's all. Almost there, almost there. I know it's a little bit tedious watching me do this, I'm sure. But we're almost there. This one doesn't need hardly anything. Very nice. See, I've not touched these end uh, angles at all. That's all, very nice. I'm just going to catch these outside faces because if I'm going to inlay them, I want them to be dead on 90 degrees if I can get them. Oh, this is getting excited. This is where the real test is. How accurately did I cut these corners? These mitres. This is good both ways. The top face looks pretty good. It's all good, that one. And this one, just in case. All good points now. I guess this is where we really, oh. I'm just gonna glue this because I think it's gonna be close enough for me not to worry about. If there is an adjustment to make, it's probably just going to be on that last star. I'm just putting this down because the super glue doesn't stick as much. One little bead of super glue on this point. Give it a little time to soak in. Lay it down, bring the adjacent one to it. It's the center point you want to be concerned about the most. Once you've got that together, take a little bit of fix it accelerator now that little bit wasn't a little bit, it wasn't as little as I wanted it to be. So if I put my glue on there, it will harden this. So I'm going to go onto this one and put the super glue on this one. Just a little bit, it's hard to put a little bit on with super glue. Get the point in place and pull together. Now I've got a feeling that there was enough accelerator on there for that to glue into place. So. I'll leave that one for now. 
go to my next one. That's looking good too. For all you Lone Star friends out there, I'm dedicating this star to you. Okay, a little bit of squirt. Now, I'm off there. I could see that point was just slightly off right in the middle. And the last one, how does this do? How is this one gonna go? Oh, I am off a little bit on a couple of points which I, disappoints me when that happens because I did put a lot of effort into my accuracy. But never mind. Actually, it's the width of the facet that's just a fraction of a, a millimetre over on that one. And now then, now this one, I need to take some off this corner of the bevel, of the angle. So I'm gonna put this, I'm pressing down onto the face and I'm, then I'm lifting up a star, just a hair, and pulling. And then I'm trying, I'm gonna do that again. But what I've got to watch for is I've got to watch for the long line of the star going across because these facets have to line up. Mm, I'm so close. So very, very close. Okay, sharp, sharp chisel. Very sharp chisel. Close, close, close. A little bit more. We're not talking very much here at all. There it is, that's it, that's it. Now then, I've got a point there, right here, that I've got to take down as well. So I can probably do that with this one inch chisel, just pear cut like this. Yep, and there it is. So now when I glue this in, I've got my star glued. A little bit of glue, not much. I'll, tell you, I'll show you why in a little minute. So I've got really, I've got no glue on the top of my facets. That's wonderful. And that was the advantage of using the super glue over the uh, PVA. So now my star is movable, flip over and put some super glue on the back edge of each of the facets where the joint lines are, just like that. And some accelerator like that. And then you can go in, you can scrape that or chisel that down. See, it's gone that powdery white that you get when you put the accelerator on the large area. I do hope that you enjoy making your Lone Star. Whether you live in Texas or not, you'll enjoy it. Making it wonderful cards. You can put them on greetings cards. You can hang them on your Christmas tree. Always remember, you learned this from me, Paul Sellers. I loved teaching you this one, especially. Mm -hmm.